I'm glad to be here, <laughs> at least. <laughs> and the motivation behind uh, this work is that uh, a growing population needs more food, and increased production in aquaculture might at least be a part of the solution. Therefore, it's a political goal, both in the national and international community, to increase the production. But the big question is then how we can increase the production and at the same time ensure that the production is sustainable. And sustainability, of course, includes much more than salmon lice, but salmon lice-induced mortality on wild salmonids is at present used as the indicator for further growth in Norway. The salmon lice-induced mortality on wild Atlantic salmon during post molt migration is assessed yearly, and at present, it is assessed to be too high in some areas in Norway. Both the farmers and authorities are, of course, eager to find solutions that can ensure increased production, both for the coming years and in a longer perspective. And since we are living in a time where it's likely that the future ocean temperature will be higher than today, it's important to investigate and understand the impact this will have for sustainability in our future aquaculture production. As a small part of this impact, and as an early warning, we have investigated how salmon lice dispersion and infection risk on wild salmonids will be influenced by higher water temperatures. So, at the Institute of Marine Research in Bergen, we are a, a group of people who together has developed a salmon louse infection risk model system, which I will present in short, before I go deeper into tree temperature dependent processes and their impact on the salmon lice infection pressure. Further, I will spend some time on how we have combined observations and models and developed two sustainability indicators. And finally, I will present an ongoing work on dispersion networks in a warmer climate and some concluding remarks. So, our modeling system, where we estimate the concentration of the infective salmon lice larvae along the Norwegian coast is like a building kit, where we have put together the different parts, giving us a handy tool to answer different questions regarding salmon lice. Then we have the release of offspring, which is estimated from the number of lice per fish and the number of fish in the farms along the coast. And then we have the three-dimensional information about the horizontal water currents, temperature and salinity from the hydrodynamic model. And a couple on that is a, is a particle tracking model and a um, salmon louse biology model. And the results are daily concentrations of infective larvae along the Norwegian coast, as seen in the right panel. To find when and where the concentration of pelagic lice is high and low, we have calibrated the model outputs against observations. And the final product is two methods which can be used to assess the impact on wild salmonids, the rock method and the virtual post method, which I will come back to later. To take a sidestep, I will try to explain why it's so important that we have both observations and model estimates available for our assessment. If we had only observations, then we can see some details quite clear. But there is always a possibility that we do not see the complete picture. And as we are working with three-dimensional data with high temporal variability, it's very likely that one or more of the dimensions or the most important information, like the water lily, are lacking. If we, on the other hand, only had model estimates, then we can see a larger part of the picture, and the resolution is normally high, both in time and space, also in the vertical dimension, but the picture is not always clear enough to identify what kind of flower it is, or to define the threshold between high and low lice concentrations. So if we are combining both observations and model products, then we can see a more complete picture, and our results can be used with higher confidence. So then back to temperature and climate change. 
As you probably heard Boogie, Boogie talking about earlier today, we find variability on timescales from hour to decades and even longer when investigating the physical environment. And to understand the variability in the environment, it's therefore important to have long time series which cover the variability. In Norway, we have regular observations of temperature and salinity from eight coastal stations back to the 1940. And this gives us valuable information about the ocean climate. Here is an example from one of those stations in the left panel, and the position is in the right panel. And I have marked temperatures which are measured and at the, which are above 16 degrees with the red stars. And as you can see, there are some warm summers in the beginning of the time series, and then occasionally in the second half of the last century, but the frequency has clearly increased, indicating a warming of the coastal water in Western Norway. And as concluded in the IPCC reports, it is likely that the temperature will continue to increase even further in the coming years. Before I start to talk about the effect the warming has on salmon lice biology, I would just like to remind you about the water temperature in Norway. Where the temperature range between winter and summer is roughly from 4 to 16 degrees in south and from 2 to 10 degrees in north. And this means that the seasonal variability and also the variation between south and north is much larger than any other temperature signal. And the standard deviation, as you see in the gray shaded areas here, is up between 1 and 2 degrees. A study on the salmon lice infection pressure in warmer climate was published last year in ISIS Journal of Marine Science, where we quantified the contribution from three different processes, which are tightly linked to water temperature. First, the hatching race is following the temperature as described in Stien et al. 2005, increasing with a factor of 2 when going from 8 to 12 degrees. Then, the infectivity or the ability the lice has to attach to a fish has been found to increase substantially as temperature increased from 5 to 15 degrees. This was a labor laboratory experiment. And finally, third, since we are assuming a constant mortality of 17% per day, a higher proportion of the larvae will reach the, reach the infective stage as the development goes faster. And summing up these three effects, it was found that the infection pressure is sensitive to changes in the temperature. And for example, if the temperature rises from 9 to 11 degrees, the infection pressure pressure was found to increase with a factor of two. And the second term, the temperature-dependent infectivity, <coughs> as, <coughs> as described by Skan Mauritsen and co-authors, was found to have the largest contribution. And in our model framework, we have used the formulation suggested in Skan Mauritsen, but there are several other papers as well who support these findings. And I think in this conference, we also will hear Matthias Ugelvik uh, talk more about this. Then, to be able to assess what this means when we are focusing on sustainable growth, we have used two methods where observations of lice on smolt in small sentinel cages and lice on wild postsmolt caught by troll has been used to find the relation between the salmon lice dose in the water masses and the infection on the fish. The calibration against data from sentinel cages uh, is an area-based method called the rock method, where maps are colored red, yellow, and green in accordance with a defined risk. The relative size of these areas is further used to define the rock index. And if the rock index becomes higher than 10, the impact of salmon lies on wild salmonids is considered to be moderate and high if the index is above 30. In our experiments, where the water temperature was increased by 2 degrees in the right panel, uh, both the size of the yellow and red area and the rock index was increased. 
and the ROC index, as you've seen, was increased from about 20 to about 30, and in this specific area then turned from moderate to high impact. The second indicator is a virtual postmolt model, where 1,000 virtual postmolts are migrating from each river during a 40-day migration period. As they are swimming from the river to the ocean, they are attached by a variable number of lies. And when they are in the position where we have an observation of a salmon postmolt, which are genetically assigned to be from the same river, then both the number of lice on the reel and the virtual fish are stored in the database for calibration. And after calibration uh, has been finished, the salmon smolt model are rerun, and this time the smolt are swimming from the river to the open ocean, before the number of lice and the following salmon lice-induced mortality is estimated for all salmon rivers. And as you see in the, in the right panel here, there are colors in red, which indicates that the mortality is above 30%, and yellow and green, which are lower mortalities. And this method is also used to, um, to, to um, investigate the sensitivity to threshold values, to early and late, late migration, and, and other things which you like to, to investigate. As for the rock method, the number of lice increased on the virtual post molt in our experiments with two degrees warmer water, as seen in the right panel, where the blue bars uh, indicate lice on the reference experiment and the orange bar on the two degree experiment. And this is preliminary results, which we are still working on. Another effect of warmer climate is that the potential dispersion distance might be reduced. And for example, at 5 degrees, it takes 34 days before the larvae reach 170 degree days, which is assumed to be the end of the free swimming larvae stage. And the number of days in the infective window decreases as the temperature goes up, as seen in the figure and in the table. And if we assume a constant background uh, current speed at 0.03 meter per second, then the traveling distance will be 88 kilometer at, um, at 5 degrees. And this is reduced to 29 kilometer at 15 degrees. And this reduction will, of course, have a large impact on the connectivity and the infection pattern between the farms. And this can be exemplified by defining dispersion networks following a method which is was published this year by Husebroten and Jonsen. And the example is from May 2019. And the colors define farms which are estimated to be in the same network. Thick lines indicate the strongest connections between the farms. And as seen, the networks on the right panels are more well-defined than those on the left, and the connection between the farms are generally weaker than in the reference run. Yes, so to conclude, if we have warmer water, then we get the increased number of offsprings, and we get increased infectivity, and we get reduced pelagic time, which also means that we have more infective larvae in the water, but then reduced dispersion and weaker connection between farms can potentially be a positive feedback and reduce the infection pressure. And climate change on current speed and salinity are still be waiting to be further investigated. Yes, and the solution, I think, is uh, cooperation. If a further growth in aquaculture production and those important food for a growing world population is only possible to close, close cooperation between science, industry, and the management authorities. And, as I have talked about today, the impact of climate change should be considered in future planning of production and management. So, thank you.